2% of their homeland that's left is being stolen before everyone's eyes and despite the ruling of the highest judicial body in the world. Only Israel has the right to defend itself. Bernie Farber, the head of the Canadian Jewish Congress, he issued a statement. He's appalled. He's shocked. He's filled with repugnance, disgust, because he saw a demonstration and an Israeli flag was being burned. But 400 Palestinian children incinerated. That doesn't concern him. Only an Israeli flag being burned at a demonstration. Then come along these human rights organizations like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch. And they babble and babble and babble some more about whether or not Israel's response was disproportionate. There's a massacre occurring before our eyes, and they can't figure out whether or not it's proportionate. It's as if a Sherman tank were to crash into a playground blowtorch the children in the playground, and Amnesty and Human Rights Watch are pondering, was that proportionate? I say, what right does Israel have to use any force against the Palestinians? If it doesn't want rockets coming its way, there's a simple solution. Join the rest of humanity. Join. <laughs> Join the 164 nations in the United Nations General Assembly. Join the International Court of Justice. Join the Arab League. Join the Palestinian Authority, so-called authority, and the Hamas, and withdraw from the territories which you are illegally occupying. Then come the Europeans, the British, the French, the Germans, and they all go to Gaza, and they all meet with Mubarak, and they meet with Omar. And why are they meeting with them? We have to figure out ways to prevent weapons from being smuggled to Hamas. Now, you have to savor that. You really do. Israel has now just committed a massacre in Gaza. Israel has incinerated the people of Gaza. Israel has committed massive war crimes in Gaza. So what do we have to do? We have to prevent Hamas and the Palestinians from having weapons. Israel commits the massacre, so what do we do? We have to disarm Hamas. Why? Do Palestinians have to be completely disarmed? Were they not satisfied with the killing ratio of 100 to 1? Should the ratio be 1,000 to 1? Is that why they want the Palestinians to be completely disarmed? That's the sad part. I would say the comical part, were it not for the fact that in my mind's eye, as I think in the mind's eye of many of you, is imprinted those pictures, those horrifying, ghastly pictures of those children who were incinerated. But there is hope, I think. There's grounds for hope. It was alluded to in the remarks, the introductory remarks of one of the uh, people here. He said, when Israeli generals, those heroic, courageous generals, who have now restored Israel's deterrence capacity, 
by committing a massacre among the defenseless. When they come to college campuses, 20 people turn up. And when those who oppose the horrific crimes being committed by what's becoming a satanic state, when the people come to oppose it, there's a significantly larger turnout. The fact of the matter is, Israel prepared very hard, not just for the military side of the war, but for the propaganda side. In the first couple of days, they boasted about how successful their propaganda was. You have to read their reports of how, how this time they didn't have male spokespersons. They sent out females, I guess this woman, Avital Labovich. I don't watch TV, but I guess that's the name. Ali Abunima calls her the blonde bombshell. I don't know what she looks like. Um, and they said they were going to send out these females to soften Israel's image. And it's true. The first couple of days, the first couple of days, it was working. Israel had everything under control. It's not too difficult to control your press. They're bought and paid for from the get-go. They give prostitutes a bad name. But they had everything. They do. They do. And I want to tell you, and I'm, not, I'm no American patriot, but there's no press more shameful than the Canadian press. It's a fact. <laughs> I looked at some of those editorials in your Globe and Mail, and my innards started to rise. I don't know where these people came from, what planet they jumped in, they fell off from, what sewer they crawled out of, but really they should go back. There's a serious problem here. <laughs> But very, very rapidly, it was quite interesting to watch this whole complex, sophisticated propaganda edifice rapidly began to collapse. Abraham Lincoln famously said, you can fool some of the people all of the time, all of the people some of the time. But you can't fool all the people all the time. And this is Israel's last free ride. Too many people now know too much about what that state is doing. And I have to add, there was, in this past war, a significant defection, defection among liberal Jews. In my opinion, this is uh, one of the things this massacre will be remembered as. It will be remembered as the last Jewish war. It will be the last time that world Jewry will give Israel blanket support for its massacres and slaughters of the Arab people. Our big weapon our most powerful weapon. It's the weapon, I think, that Gandhi talked about when he spoke about, when he had to give a name to his movement in India, his nonviolent movement. He couldn't find the right words. He didn't like the word passive resistance because he kept saying that nonviolence is very active. It's not passive. If I had time, I would discuss it at some length, because I, I do like a lot of what Gandhi has to say in the topic. Uh, but So he was trying to find the right word, and I think it was his cousin who gave him the word, which he eventually used. Uh, who knows what the word is? Satyagraha. And what does it mean? OK. <laughs> That's the good part. Uh, it means he translated as Hold on to the truth. Satyagraha. Hold on to the truth. And I think that has to be our motto. Our most formidable weapons are truth and justice. What's true and what's right. 